What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Club Metaverse <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I'm here with it's Dwayne changed, Dunham. Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm here with Dwayne Dunham, legendary director, editor, and I can't wait to get into this conversation. Worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Return of the Jedi, um, uh, Twin Peaks, uh, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, the list goes on and on. And I am so happy to welcome Mr. Dwayne Dunham. Dwayne, how are you, sir? Excellent, Mark. Thank you. And thanks for having me. This is great. I, I get to review uh, some ancient history. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, you know, for you, it's ancient history. For me, it's the fundamental pillars that pretty <laughs> much all my, you know, all my passions were built on. And, you know, I will just cut right into it. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you got started at a young age into this business. Mm, well, I just had a an interest in cameras really from a young age. And I had a friend who, a neighbor who lived across the street, his dad uh, worked for NASA and he was a camera buff. And uh, I started, you know, kind of experimenting with things. And <clears throat> what I found is my dad would take the, the family camera on trips. And then he was, you know, obsessed with showing people the home movies, which are so boring. And so since I had to endure that, I would sneak off with the camera without anybody knowing it. And I would shoot something oh, that wow. only I knew was going to pop up. And was this a Kodak eight millimeter camera? Yeah, or? This is a eight millimeter. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one day, one of my dad's friends, when, when they were leaving the house, he said, you know, your stuff is kind of funny and, and clever. You, you should put a coffee can by the door here and ask for donations. Oh, wow. And I thought, what a great idea. <laughs> so right. That's kind of how it started. But then I went to film school and. Um, Where'd you go? I went to San Francisco State. I, I had a, <clears throat> I got into USC and I, I just really wanted to go to USC. I'm from Southern California. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just didn't work out. I either wasn't ready. Actually, I'll tell you what. I knew if I stayed in Southern California, as soon as springtime rolled around and it was sunny, I would be at the beach. Right, right. And I knew if I'm going to go to school and be serious, I got to go someplace that's kind of cold and dreary and I want to be indoors. And that was San Francisco. So, you know, in, in hindsight, now I always thought, well, I'll go back to SC and do my master's. And, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to teach a few classes here and there when my schedule allows at SC. So I maintain the connection. That's cool. But I, you know, it's one of those things. I never would have had the career that I have had, had I stayed in Southern California and gone to SC. It just, things opened up. My first movie, the week after I graduated from film school, was as an apprentice on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh my God. That's I know. That... I know. And it's like, you know, Milos Foreman and Milos. And... Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for me in film school, that was a, that's a, it's a whole other world, uh, the world of professional filmmaking. And they were over in Berkeley at Fantasy Records, Saul Zantz. I was in San Francisco and I'd occasionally hear something or read it in the paper, the pink pages at the time, the Chronicle in San Francisco. And I would just think, I, I, I'm not even part of that world. I, this is amazing to me. Wow. It, you know, they're 20 minutes away, but it they may, have, may have been 20 light years away. What, what was, you know, first of all, you just blew my mind because like in my research on your work, I actually hadn't, I didn't know that you, that, that you were around the set of such an important film, you know, like it's always one of my favorite um, um, kind of trivia tidbits about Hollywood that One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is only one of three films to win all five major That's Oscars. Right. That's uh, right. The other one being Science of the Lambs, which is another, you know, masterpiece. Yes. And then uh, the other one is of um, It Happened One Night. Uh, That's, which, that's which, correct. Yeah, which goes you know way back. But what was what 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 kind of memories do you carry with you from your time on the set of such a monumental piece of American history or, well, or film I, history? I, yeah, I want to clarify. I wasn't on the set. They shot up in uh, I think Salem, Oregon, okay. and Coons Bay, and you know they were shooting. I was still in 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 film school, finishing mm -hmm. up. So I started in May. 
I had just graduated mid-May and they were in post-production. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, and that it was, was a, it, it was a, an instructor that I had had at, at uh, in film school, San Francisco State. And literally my car was packed. I was staying at a friend's house. I had moved out. All my belongings were in this little Volkswagen. And that morning I got up and got in the car, turned over the engine. And just as I was to pull away, my friend came out and said, hey, I, you know, there's a phone call. I think you should take it. So <laughs> oh, wow. shut the car. And I was, I was going to drive to Southern California. I had a job offer from Warren Miller in mm. Hermosa Beach to make ski films and surf movies. Okay. And that's kind of what I grew up. That was kind of my thing growing <laughs> right. up. Anyway, uh, it was so fortuitous because two minutes later, I would have been on the highway um, and he offered me a job. And I said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> see, that that's life, man. When you yeah. see that that small little crack in the door, like, you yes, know, that's exactly. And, and, you know, that I thought, honestly, Mark, I thought all movies were like that because I didn't know any different. I just right. knew this is how student films are done and here's movies that I see in the theater, but to, to get in and see the nuts and bolts and the people who are actually, you know, creating it, it uh, was just, uh, every day was mind blowing. And I would just, the people I met and the experiences I was around and, and I will just tell you this. I remember we were at the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley for a screening and it was only the, the crew. So it was real small, maybe 10 people. And uh, we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and I couldn't figure out why are we waiting? Why don't we just start the movie? And then the door in the lower right hand corner opened and you could barely see because of the light streaming in. In walk Jack Nicholson, Clint Eastwood, and Michael Douglas. Wow. And they right. sat down kind right, of. Because Michael front. Douglas was a producer on the film, right? That's right, because his dad, yeah. Kirk, had owned the book and the rights for a long, long time. And, and, and actually, he, Kirk Douglas, wanted to be R.P. McMurphy. Mm. So, you know, and, and Cuckoo's Nest ran uh, at the north point theater in san francisco for i think several years it was a long-running stage play anyway it was michael who was up there doing streets of san francisco and he he got the rights from his dad and then he went to evidently to saul zantz and saul was the guy who put up the money and i you know i, th I think at the time it was six or seven million dollars something like that seemed like to me that was a, a king's fortune that's incredible it's incredible yeah and and all I what I remember about that screening is, you know, you would just get lost in the movie. That's how good it was. And I remember hearing coming from the front of the theater many, many times throughout this sort of giggle and Nicholson saying, this is it. Oh, <laughs> this that's is a good impression. <laughs> this is it. He was right. He was absolutely he was right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was absolutely right. What a masterpiece of a film. That that when I was at film school, that's the movie that everybody was like, OK, this is it. And I remember we even did our own little stage presentation of it just to learn, you know, like, you know, directing for uh, uh, you know, directing actors, you know, was, yes. was you know, pages from from uh, from that script. So, so, so did you work with Sheldon Kahn and Lindsay Klingman on, yes. on this a little bit? Yes. Not so much Shelley, but but Lindsay. Yes. And Richard Chu. Mm. Um you know, and then, of course, Richard went on to be one of the editors on Star Wars. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it, that's it wasn't my next movie, but it was the one after that. I did another movie with Saul Zantz there at Fantasy right after Cuckoo's Nest. Um, and, you know, Saul asked me to stay on. It was so kind of him. And like, what do you think that is? Like, like, what is it about the work ethic or what you brought to the table? Because I think that's, that, that, that's a good thing to impart to young people is like, here you are 20 minutes ready to move down to, you know, San Francisco and record surf movies. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're working on literally one of the greatest films ever made. And you take advantage of that opportunity and parlay that into a career. What, what do you think was your mentality that kind of set you up for that? 
Well, I, I'll I'll tell you, but I but I but but the P word that's most important for anybody, I think, in any career path is perseverance. Mm. You know, your path is never without you know rocks and things, and and you can stumble. But for me, I think it was simply enthusiasm, mm -hmm. and I had a a very positive attitude. I worked. Uh, I think it was a. Uh, I don't know what it was, uh, whatever my shift was when I started. And then, then, of course, you know, we got up pressure mounted and we had to get going. And they said, well, we're going to we're going to hire somebody else that'll that'll come in and work after you. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> right. Right, right. right. So I wound up, honestly, for about seven months, I worked a 17 hour a day shift. Wow. Seven days a week. Loving every minute of it. Every it didn't matter what I was doing. I didn't care. I just was there and I was a sponge. And, you know, I thought, look, you're a film student. You think you know everything. You're young. You think you know everything. I didn't know anything. Right, right, right. And, <laughs> you know, and I was when we would have a screening, I was the guy up in the machine room, you know, running the projectors and you in those days, you know, films on two different projectors and those, those little dots go by and you start the other one, then the dots again and you yeah. flip it over and it should be seamless. And I'd be up there staring out that little porthole and I'd be looking at the screen. I'd see, you know, the, the, the leader go flap, flap, flap and the screen go white. And I would sit there for a minute and think, what the hell's the matter with that guy in the, and I turn around <laughs> right. and look behind me, realize that's me. I'm in the machine room. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I got the reputation of, oh no, not him. Don't put him up there. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And, and then like what, when you were in the editing bay, um, were you like, like cataloging film strips? Were you scraping emulsion? Were, were you making cuts and no, like presenting no, no. them? No, 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 not on Cuckoo's Nest. That for all intents and purposes, the picture was was cut by then, and that was that was the domain of, um, you know, Richard and Lindsay, and to some extent at that point, Shelley, and mm -hmm. and then uh, the assistants that were were on the show. Um, so I was, and that's you know, I didn't, I wasn't credited, and I often look back at that. In those days, you didn't get credit. For, I mean, sure. today, I think almost everybody gets a right, film right. credit. And, you know, it's important, but I, you know, I know I did it. And, of course, of <laughs> and course. it was great. It was a great experience. So then, so then, um, because you're saying that you only worked on one more project with Saul before you met a young, skinny kid with a great head of hair and a beautiful beard named George Lucas. Or how did you, how did you come across uh, meeting George or going okay. from, from Cuckoos to George? So, so I was this guy who, you know, I didn't have any money. I would just graduate, made it through film school with no money, no, no anything. And, and all of a sudden I wind up over in Berkeley at Fantasy Records and their meals are catered by Narcy's, a French deli in Berkeley. And, and there's a banquet room and there's weight rooms and saunas and steam rooms and kitchens and, and, you know, like I said, I worked those long shifts and I would just, I lived there. I just mm. told the, the guys, you know, the guys clean up at night, wherever you find me in the morning, wake me up at six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> oh, that's great. And so when we would finish, let's just say it was midnight, you'd finish or even, you know, one or two in the morning we would clear, clear out the main uh, mixing studio, Studio A, and some recording group would, would come in and they'd record all through the night. Mm. And it was, you know, so it was like, I had entertainment. <laughs> I had right, right. So I then, uh, Saul did a movie um, called uh, Three Warriors. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to to stay, be an assistant editor, and I did. And we did that movie, and then that movie was done. And I got a phone call one day from this woman, and she introduced herself. It's Jane Bay. She works for George Lucas. In just a minute, George would like to talk to you. Just and out I, of just just because somehow you connected with Jane and Jane, or 
so, uh, well, I, I, I'm sure it was, you know, there's this guy that right. kind of fit the profile, what George was looking, what he, what he said to me, I'm looking for a resident assistant editor. Well, here I am. <laughs> right, right, right. You're I'm living in the place. Right? Yeah. You're the resident, literally the resident assistant editor. Yeah. And so I, after 10 times saying, get out of here, who put you up to this? There's no way George wants to talk to me. And she said, you know, just hang on. So he got on the phone. Hello. I said, hello. And <laughs> wow. he said, I want you to come work. This is George. I want you to come work for me. And they were pretty much finished with post on Star Wars. On the Same first situation one. as Cuckoo's Nest. Right. You know, you always need the cleanup people to come in. And so um, I said, maybe you ought to meet me first. And he said, OK. And we we made a date. I think it was the next day. But I I went into fantasy that next morning. And and when Saul's aunts walked in, I I said to Saul, I said, Saul, you're never going to believe this. But I got this call from George Lucas. He wants me to come work for him. And Saul didn't skip a beat. He said, do it. He right. said, I, I don't great. I don't want to see you go, but you can't pass this up. And I said, but Saul, I mean, I like it here. And, and, and this is kind of like home. Right, right. <laughs> he said, look, just go see what he has to say and do me a favor. Don't leave me in the lurch. Don't just, you know, quit today. And so I drove over to Marin and I met George and um, he told me why an assistant uh, resident assistant editor and what it entailed. And, and, you know, I'm sitting there and I, you know, I love THX 1138. I did my, my thesis on THX 1138. Oh, so wow. I'm standing in front of a guy who I just think is, is great. And he offers me the job and I said, you know, George, I got to tell you something to be honest. I, I really want to just make my own movies. And he said to me, and I think this is important. He said, there's three ways you go about that. One is you go out and get whatever job you can and you learn filmmaking by directing and putting together whatever it is. And the second is you write and ev eventually you control your own writing. And sorry. Oh, and, okay, no worries. Um, and uh, get the opportunity to direct your own written material. The third way you do it, he said, is you learn it through editing. Mm. And I said, I kind of thought for a minute, and I said, give me five minutes, will you? Right. <laughs> so I walked outside like a knucklehead, and like, okay, George Lucas, he's offering me a job. That's crazy. <laughs> what are you, are you crazy? <clears throat> so I, you know, of course I said yes, but I said, you know, but, um, but I, you know, I, I'm working over at Fantasy and Saul asked me to not leave him in the lurch. And George says, that's fine. Um, you know, can you split your time? And I said, that's easy. So I went, you know, a couple, two, three weeks, I would work days with George and then I'd work the afternoon evenings over at Fantasy. I just drive back and forth across the bridge. Yeah. And when I went back that day, we we were having a screening and and so... I, I walked in to the fantasy screening. It was in progress. And I sat down and um, when the screening was over, the lights came on. And the first question that was posed is Saul got up and he walked right over in front of me and he said, so what'd you do? That's incredible, man. <laughs> I, Saul I, Sons, like a legend. You yeah. Know, yeah. Saul, asking about another legend. What a mensch. What a great guy. What yeah. a great guy. And so I said, Saul, I, I took the job, but, you know, but I'm going to split time for a while. So Saul just got this big smile on his face and he turned to everybody in the room and said, guys, I want you to know, George Lucas just stole Dwayne away from us. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. It, yeah, it he, is. It's like, OK. You know, and I've been I've been lucky in my time to to have hired a lot of people um, and, and have had a lot of employees. And it always feels good. Um, when an employee gets a new, bigger opportunity that yes. I'm capable of of giving them, and 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 it's funny because they always come to me, they're always nervous, 
You know, it's always kind of like right. breaking up with somebody or telling somebody that they have <laughs> terminal cancer. But like, no, man, I'm happy for you. You know, yes. like life is all about growth, you know, and, right. and, and, and you got to be unapologetic about embracing that growth. Yes. And so, you know, I consider myself very lucky and and, you know, luck is when, you know, preparation meets opportunity. And I wasn't yeah. I wasn't you know, I've learned I continue to learn to this day and I've just been blessed that, you know, once I went with George, you know, we did Star Wars and more American graffiti and Black Stallion and Empire and Raiders and Jedi. And uh, I don't know, I think there might've been something else in there. Yeah. Oh, Temple of Doom was the last one in there. And, and, you know, then George was, he was going to retire. That's the first time he retired and going to, you know, not do anything for a while. After, after Return of the Jedi. After Return of the Jedi, yes. And so, you know, George was in the midst of reshuffling his company. And, you know, when I started with George, I think I was the fourth person hired. Oh, so, wow. Well, at, at the ranch or, or at Lucasfilm. No, the ranch didn't even right. exist. We were, right, right. We were up at, uh, in San Anselmo, the, uh, the studio there. And um, he did eventually buy the ranch and you know so i remember all of those days as well and and after jedi george said you know i want you to st stick around and i said george what will i do will i just play tennis all day every day i mean if you're not making movies um, <laughs> maybe the best thing is i go out and i get some more experience and hopefully down the line we'll get back together again right and so that's what I did. And, and that's when almost a repeat phone call came through. I did go off to Miami to do a movie called The Mean Season that I, I cut. Phil Borsos was the director and it was a, an Orion picture. And we were doing post, uh, you know, right there in San Rafael where we had cut Jedi. And, and then I got a phone call. And it was it was this woman saying, David Lynch wants to talk to you. And I said the same thing. I said, get out of here. <laughs> and who is this? And she puts David on and David says, hello, this is this is David Lynch. I want you to come work for me. Yeah. And I told him the same thing. I said, David, maybe you ought to meet me first. <laughs> and he said, all right. Well, when I'm down here at Raleigh Studios in L.A., when you, can you be here? And I said, well, like probably tomorrow. Let me see if I can work this out. And so that's, I, I came down and he handed me a script for blue velvet and he said, give this a read and let me know. And I had a couple other three or four or five different opportunities. Uh, one of which was trying to find money to direct a movie that, that I wanted to do that I controlled. And, and I, I read Blue Velvet and I was wow. just completely disturbed by it. I mean, I couldn't put it down. By the script it was, itself, like like you were oh, seeing that you were oh. seeing that 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 seed. Yeah, I mean, those, these people were running around the room. They were so real. Right. And, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And so um I had made uh arrangements to fly back from LA and I, I, right there at Larkspur Landing in Marin, I was going to meet some friends to see a movie. And, and I was early. So I pulled in the parking lot and I was finishing reading the script and I saw my friends. I just slunk down in my chair. I hope they don't see me because I can't talk to anybody. Right, 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 right. <laughs> the script is like really something. So then I called David and he says, what do you think? And I said, well, David, it's great. And I think you're great, but I don't think it's my cup of tea. Ooh. And he, he said, what do you mean your cup of tea? And I right. said, well, that sounds very David Lynch. Yeah. I said, well, you know, I'm kind of more a Disney guy. And he says, yeah, okay. And, you know, and David, this isn't Disney. And he says, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then he told me something like, he says, look, Sometimes we have to write things in a way that these studio executives can understand. It doesn't mean it's going to necessarily quite literally be that way. But, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, now 
I just saw a racer head for the first time right. with George Lucas and Stanley Kubrick when we were in post on Empire. No, no, in no. What, 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 what? You screened in racer head with Stanley and George in no, the same room? Stanley was at L Street with post-production on The Shining and we were shooting and, and cutting. And Stanley called over to the cutting room one day and he said, hey, uh, have have you guys ever seen this David Lynch movie, Eraserhead? And we said, no, but we've heard a lot about it. We'd really like to. And he, Stanley says, it's one of my favorite films. I've seen it 35 or 40 times. I'll wow. screen it for you guys Friday night at the theater here at Elstree. And we're like, okay. <laughs> wow. Was this, was this, had you met Stanley before in person? No. Wow. <laughs> No, I was reading, though, the book, The Shining. And, you know, and we were busy and, you know, we it was so, so wonderful at that time. I think it was. I don't remember what sometimes these movies get get confused for me. Anyway, um, we 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 watched the movie and there's a, a few funny stories about that. But, you know, Kubrick, the movie started, he got up and he left the theater. And right. I thought to myself, now, the only reason I'm there, honestly, is because I rode to and from the studio every day with George. I right. stay at the hotel down the street. He'd stay at the fancy place. I'd stay, <laughs> stay right. down the street. But, and this so, is, but this is already after you've edited uh, A Return of the Jedi, right? This is after no, this you, is before. This, this is, is before. This is, this is before. This is early on. This is, this is, we're just shooting Empire. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and so... Um, anyway, it was just one of those funny, funny situations where I, I thought, oh, Stanley, he's, he's testing us. He wants to see, you know, how much we can take because, you know, <laughs> a racer head is really something and it's the longest 90 minutes. I've told David this too. I said, David, it's the longest 90 minutes in the history of cinema. I said, that movie goes on for about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that's anyway, a great line. That's a great. Anyway, line. when it was over, I, I Stanley came back into the room, and and I'm, I'm thinking, please don't anybody say anything about going to get something to eat because I just want to go back to London, my hotel, and take a shower. I I have no appetite. I I gotta digest right. this. <laughs> right, right. But then of Kubrick, course, Kubrick says, "Hey, you guys want to go next door and grab a meal?" And I'm like. But please, George, say no. <laughs> right, right. But of course, George says yes. Yes. And so we um, we <laughs> we trudged through the snow and had a meal. And I just sat there looking at Lucas talking to Kubrick, you know, for an hour or two. You got to give me a little bit of a fly on the wall vibe on this, because these are literally two of my biggest heroes in cinema, with, with George being the guy who practically invented modern cinema as we know it with the, you know, by turning into a true expression of technology, right? Of how do you leverage technology to help the storytelling? That's and right. With, and Stanley too, to a certain degree, I think also uh, really used technology as a tool to tell the story. But how, how were these, like, what was the chemistry like between these two guys? All right. So you ask, I will tell you the story. Please. You know, I was just a young guy. I, I had no place being there. I just was riding, like I said, with George. And and I don't think I said anything the whole night. I just sat there and and one was on one end of the table, another on the other. And, and I was just observing both of them. And my recollection is they didn't talk much about technology. They didn't talk about film technology. Right, right. They did talk about technology and, and kind of, you know, how it might service mankind and the future. And Stanley, uh, of course, talked about his books a lot. You know, he was a voracious reader, that guy. He would, he would buy books by the, by the, you know, huge bundle boxes. Wow. And um, I had this one observation and I was looking at these two guys and they both talk and they use their hands a lot. Okay. And I was sitting there and I'm looking and I said to myself, I said, this is amazing. You could take Kubrick's hands and give them to George and give Lucas's hands 
to Kubrick and you'd never know the difference. Wow. Their hands are identical and they gesture in exactly the same way. Interesting. Dinner's over. We get up. Thank goodness. We're on our way back into London and George and I are sitting in the back of this car and, and our driver, uh, I forget his name. <sighs> Sorry. He's just barreling down the motorway and it's, it's real quiet. We're not saying anything. And right. Right. Sudden, the, pardon me. No, 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 no. Yeah. All of a sudden George leans over, he turns to me and he says, Hey, did you happen to notice Kubrick's hands? <laughs> and I'm just about to tell him what I just told you. And George says, he has the weirdest looking hands. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, wow. I never told, I've never told him to this day. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And, yeah. and just, just so I can contextualize this in the in the era of Stanley Kubrick, this is this is around the time of Full Metal Jacket. Just, or... He was in post production at L Street Studio on The Shining. The Shining had oh, not the come Shining. Out okay, yet. so this so is he... like 77, 78 around that so, time. Yes, because we were shooting probably seventy eight ish. We were shooting Empire. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Wow, and, and did did when 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 um. When you were working on Empire, was was George the kind of creator who's constantly using the work as the point of conversation, or would would he actually not do that so much? Right, because I've met both, and I'm kind of the former. Where like for now, for example, I'm working on a big VR game. You know that that's how I worked with David yeah. Lynch. You know, like yeah. VR is kind of like my thing. Now it, you know, anyway. Um, and I'm always thinking and talking about it, you know, um, when you guys were driving after dinner with a legend, after watching such a disturbing film, is the conversation about empire or is it about what you guys just went through? The only words spoken was what I just told you. Right. George's right. officer. I didn't say anything after that. <laughs> he didn't say anything. We just in silence. Vic, Vic was our driver. Vic, good old and Vic. Vic. Shout out to Vic. A million miles an hour, and we're just barreling down the M40. Not another word. Um, but but George, you know, George lived his movies. I think a lot right. of us do. Right. It, that that's you know, he's very successful. And and I know as an editor working for George, I would work on a scene and I would think, oh, this scene's pretty good, it's working. And then he's, he'd make some notes and, and, you know, I'd kind of scratch my head and say, how's he come up with these notes? And then after a while, a few years, I, I, I just got to thinking, well, maybe he's already seen this scene in his head mm. and he's just waiting until somehow I get it close to that vision that he saw in his head. And yeah. when that happens, he'll say, good, fine, it's done. And, and, and let me ask you a little bit about that, because, you know, like I said, uh, when we uh, were about to start, Return of the Jedi is probably m my favorite of the original. I mean, look, every one of them is a to me is like on this citadel of godliness that's untouchable. Yeah, yeah. I'm right. talking about the first six, you know, the first six movies. Yeah. Um, the the Return of the Jedi is such a special film for me because that to me is when George's vision all comes together. And to me, my favorite scene in the whole movie is probably at the very beginning when you first see um, Luke Skywalker walking into Jabba's palace and he's wearing the cloak over his head and he's got that kind of Sith uh, aesthetic, you know, that, that, that would permeate so much in the prequels and stuff like that, like that, you know, the, the lexicon, the visual lexicon really came together in Return of the Jedi for me. Um, now... In the process, would you have the script and storyboards because it was such a technical feat that you had to almost try to mimic the storyboards? Or how, how, how did that process go? Like, what were your tools when you started ripping, uh, uh, you know, strips apart? Well, George had this saying. He's got several. And one, um, and it was, you know, there was a time when I, was going to go off and I was going to Africa to direct my first movie. Mm. And I called George and I asked him for some advice. 
And this is what he told me. When you get to the cutting room, throw the script away. <laughs> now, this would cause David Lynch heart palpitations. <laughs> right. And Stanley, too, probably. Or maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. But uh, No, Stanley, I think he's pretty close to the book, I would say. Right, right. Now, you know, a guy like Stephen, George would say, Stephen shoots the movie. George would analyze his own style and say, I, George, I shoot around the movie. And then I find it in the cutting room. Right. And that's very much the case. George is a genius editor. I've never, ever, ever, ever seen anybody who holds a candle to the guy. Ever. As an editor. As, a, as an editor. Across the board to visualize and implement the thought. And, you know, you talk, uh, you know, the metaverse and all this business we're talking about today. I can tell you in the late 70s, George would sit there and we'd be cutting on some flatbed and and he'd stop and turn to me and he'd say, you know, someday we're, we're, we're going to have a hat. And I said, a hat? He says, yeah, we're going to have a hat. What for? He says, well, because when we think the idea, the machine's going to do it for us immediately. Right, right. He's, he's absolutely that. right. He's think absolutely right. That 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elon Musk talks about that on Joe Rogan every time he gets a yes. chance. Yeah. And and I remember the first time he, he turned to me about that same time and he said, you know, someday we're going to have a, a digital trim bin and a, and a digital. And uh, he invented it, which is amazing. Script. He invented it. We Well, we, we invented the edit droid, the first yeah. nonlinear, you know, so-called digital editing machine. And I, my response was a what? <laughs> what's <Right>. digital <laughs> right right i uh when i was a kid um i was obsessed with george obviously like 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 most kids at that you know that grew up in the 80s and um i saved up money for almost two years to buy an amiga 500 uh -huh. because the amiga 500 at the time was the only consumer level machine that allowed you to use a program called video toaster which yeah, was a, right. I remember that's I haven't heard that term in years. Yeah, yeah. Which was a a a a home version of an offline editing system built around the concept that George Lucas invented. You know, right. which, which is like people don't realize this guy just didn't make some great movies. He made the movie industry. You know, it, it's it's yes. quite it's quite amazing. His thing was to develop research and develop the technology that would allow him to tell the stories he wanted to tell. Mm. And that's why of the, of the Star Wars movies, I think my favorite, I still say is, if I had to pick, I would say is Star Wars because it was so new and different and, and, and rough around the edges. I like that. Right, right. By the time we, by the time we got to Jedi, my take on it, it was just kind of too sanitized. It just was, mm. but, but then empire, I think had the strongest story and, and, you know, character development interaction, you know, Luke finds out about Vader and Vader, you know, all this stuff. It's, you know, you, you, empire carries a lot of weight. Without a doubt. And how long, how long did you spend cutting uh, return of the Jedi? I, okay, I would say, I want to say we started shooting in January of whatever year that was, 82-ish maybe. Okay. And okay, so we, yep. started, we started cutting at the same time. As you were shooting, you would start cutting. Yes. As a matter of fact, the first, I, I, I did the first three scenes, which was a sequence. And those were the first three scenes I cut uh, on that movie that George gave me just, that was the first time he said, just here, you cut these scenes. And the first was the two robots, R2 and 3PO approaching Jabba's palace. Mm -hmm. And it's just robots, right? And, and you're not working with storyboards. You're not working with script. You're nope. working with footage footage i look i it was drilled into me i never saw george the only reason george would ever look at the script and post is he would say do we have any kind of shot like this what did they shoot here 
Right, That's all right. he cared about. He's looking for coverage. That's it. Be He's because just... because his thing was, and this is his genius. He said, that's why you throw the script away. The script's the script. It doesn't matter what the script says. It doesn't even matter your intent when you shot it. The only thing that matters is the film is going to tell you what it is and what it wants to be. Yeah. That's his genius. And, right. you know, I, I saw him take the first 20 minutes of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah. And trim it down to 10 minutes. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. That guy is he's he's of another world, and he does it on the fly. He doesn't look at it and and no, he he's giving you cuts as he's watching it for the first time. It's amazing. Never seen anything like it. And to jump around a little bit, um, when you were working on Raiders, did you work very closely with Michael Kahn? Was what was he like a mentor to you? Was he fun to learn from? What yeah. what was he like? Okay, so. Well, Michael is a great, great guy, and I will tell anybody, I will t say it right here, right now, he is the best working film editor in the business. Wow. I think the best that's ever been. Michael is the best, and he's a great guy, but it was a funny thing because we were, what the heck were we doing? Oh, I know what we were doing. I know what I was doing. I was working on another movie called Dragon Slayer. Oh, of course. Classic. 80s classic. Yeah, with, with George's friends. And, and when they asked me to, to help them out, because I could interface with ILM, I said, um, let me ask George. And they said, well, make sure that George isn't going to steal you away, because we, we, if you're going to do this, you're going to stay with us. And so I asked George and he said, yeah, we're not doing anything. You know, Stephen's cutting Raiders down in L.A. And yeah, sure. Go ahead. And so I did. And then we screened. Stephen called George and said, Raiders is ready. Michael Kahn and Stephen cut it in L.A. and said, do you want to see it? And George says, sure, bring it up to the studio. We'll run it on Friday night. And George asked me to come over and we watched that movie and. I would, you know, again, I, I have no around guys like those guys. I, I'm not going to say anything except right. in that case I did. I said, guys, this is terrific. I, I wouldn't even go to answer print or mix. I just release it. <laughs> right, right. The work track. I don't care. This thing is great. Right. And George kind of, you know, and he says, you know, Stephen, would you mind if I do some nudgies? And what, 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 is, what is a nudgie? Is that an yeah. actual phrase that George would use? Nudgie? Oh, yeah. And that's what Stephen said. He says, George, what's a nudgie? <laughs> right. And George says, well, you know, it's a nudgie. It's like a frame here, a frame there. Nothing big. Just, you know, just like, you know, a little trim. And Stephen's like, okay. And, and then George turned to Michael and he said, Michael, bring the movie up and and he turned to me and said let's set up a cutting room over in the other building and uh, this is and, right after you watched it for the first time yes wow that's amazing yeah and and he said and and, and by the way go tell matt and hal i'm going to borrow you for a while and i said george you're going to have to do that i already told him this wasn't going to happen right, right. so george says michael bring everything the trims and outs everything because we're on film reels and steven says whoa 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 george this doesn't sound like a nudgie <laughs> this and, doesn't and, sound like a nudgie <laughs> yeah george says it'll be okay it's just you know it's just i just want to play and so michael came up and we worked for about six weeks wow and my nudgie. schedule i would start with michael at 4 a.m wow and I'd work till 10 a.m. And then I would go across town to work on Dragon Slayer from 10 to 6. Wow. At 6 o'clock, I'd walk back across town and I'd meet George at about 6.15 or so. And he'd work until about 8 or 9 o'clock. And wow. then I'd kind of clean up and get ready for Michael in the next day. That's incredible, man. Like to have that level of, of of mental discipline to put in that many hours into something is the only reason. I mean, that that is just again that the answer to life is hard work. 
you know, and remember we started, I said, I always wanted to go to SC to, to get my master's. I got a master's. Oh, my I God. I didn't go to SC and to get PhD. it. PhD. Yeah, you got double I, PhD. I, was, I mean, it was, you. You. it doesn't get any, you love these people. They're your friends. I had no other life. That yeah. was it for me. And I, I, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And so George basically took the first 20 minutes and he made it 10. Okay. And then there's a period way down, you know, that's always, it's the slow part of movies and it's Marion in the tent with Belloc and right. she's faking getting drunk. And, and George took that scene and he intercut it twice with Indy and Sala uh, going into the well of souls. Oh, which is a great, you just gave me chills because that yeah. is a great, that is a great intercut. Oh so my George God. George did that himself. He did that. Because that he, creates so much tension in both yeah. scenes. Because it, it, you know, first of all, the, the character is pretending like she's drunk and you think Belloc is drunk and pretty soon you're sitting there and you're watching this scene go on for 20 minutes. You're starting to rock and fall asleep. <laughs> right, right. And then George goes, watch this. Boom. <laughs> right. That's incredible. So oh. because because yeah, because then it culminates with with George with Belloc realizing that Mary is trying to pull a ruse on him. And yeah. then it ends with Belloc looking at yeah. Indy full of full of the snakes. You know, that's, it, it goes right. to show once again that there's nothing that you can possess, which I cannot take away. That's right. And then uh, we then George called Stephen and said, Stephen, come on up and take a look at your picture. And Stephen came up, same little group and only this time. And George always said all and this is this is important. He, he said, always save one person whose opinion you trust to the very end. Mm. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah, because, you know, you get a little jaded, you, you know, you lose objectivity and we would, you know, you asked a question, how long were we, did we cut? We cut Jedi, what we started shooting in January, we started cutting in January, we didn't finish until May. In right. fact, the, the 70 millimeter prints that came out a week or two before the 35 millimeter prints aren't as finished as because we had to start sooner. We were out of time. We were, I was in LA literally with the negative cutters as shots would come from ILM. We didn't have time for those few shots to go to a positive print. I would just hold the negative up to the light and say, cut it right here. Are you serious? <laughs> the, the actual negative, because there's only the one. The actual negative. There's only You're one. Like, pretty dangerous at that point. Yeah, you know, for the people that don't know, like you know, because I learned this when I was at film school. When you sh back in the old days, when you shot a film, you you only have one negative, and then you yes. you got to conform your your prints to your negative, and then you literally got to scrape the emulsion off the negative and cut it. That's and, right. And you lose that frame when you do it. And you lose that frame when you do it. And there's no going back. You know, there's no, no uh, you know, there, there's no control alt delete. Um, so what? So, so, so Stephen came up and we screened Raiders now for the second time. And it was amazing. It was as if there were flames coming out of the projector. That's incredible. That movie was smoking. It was just, it was just flying. And it was over. And we're all jumping around, patting each other on the back. This is fantastic. This is so great. So much fun. And the only person, you know, that hadn't seen the first version was Marsha. Oh, wow. And, and she was there and she, we heard this voice say, fellas, I don't want to rain on your parade or anything. We're like <laughs> really happy. It's over. And it's great. And she says, I just have one question. And everybody went, what? Like, what could it possibly be? Right, right. And Marcia says, what happened to the girl? And the four or five of us just went like this. Oh, shit. He's right. <laughs> we left Marion tied to the stake, never to be seen again. <laughs> oh, the, oh, right. I've, I've actually heard this, that in the original cut, there is no final scene with them going down the um, the stairs. museum, yeah, 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 of the stairs. 
So, yeah, a man wrote the script, a man directed it, a man edited it. Uh, you know, but Marsha is a brilliant film editor in her yeah, own yeah. right. And she was absolutely right. And and the the genius of George and Stephen both is that they immediately recognized there is a problem and she's absolutely right. And within three or four or five minutes, uh, how can we fix it? Oh, let's let's do a little pickup shot. Uh, she'll be outside the door because there's only two little scenes left in the movie after that. And Indy comes out from talking to the, the government guys and they'll have a little dialogue and they wrote the dialogue right there on the spot. And, and then George said, you know what, we'll shoot it. Uh, City Hall in San Francisco, set it up. But that's it. Right. And that's yeah. the final scene. That's them walking down the stairs. That's right. And then the very next shot is the last shot of the movie was the, the which is a legendary shot. Yeah. Legendary the, shot. The box with the art going into that warehouse with, you know, thousand other boxes, but that 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 shot was part of the original. Yes, cut. Yeah, 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 because that's such a monumental moment that, like, I'm sure you guys were all patting yourself on the back for that shot for months because that well, is such a great ending. You know, look the the movie. I will I I will say to aspiring filmmakers, watch the first ten minutes of Raiders and turn the sound off. Right. You don't need music. You don't just watch it. Yeah, yeah, You're going to yeah. see storytelling at its finest. 1, Stephen, he puts the camera in exactly the right place. The timing of the shots with Michael and the angles. And it's just brilliant. And as a matter of fact, George, uh, and I most often don't cut with sound either, but George doesn't cut with sound. You know, what? one thing, and look, uh, we're already at 50 minutes. Typically, okay. <laughs> typically, I'm already towards the end. I'll stay longer if it's okay with you. It's just like, this is just, you know, but yeah. I'll be sensitive to your time. But I do want to ask this, because I'm such a Raiders guy. What, what 10 minutes got cut out of that first opening? Because that opening, to your point, is a perfect opening. Yes. What, what else was in there that got sort of taken out? Was it the same action, just longer? Yep. You, you, would, you wouldn't miss it at all now you know i, I want to be clear it was brilliantly cut i i wouldn't have thought but george was of the mind look if indy you know he's going to take one or two steps on these stones he doesn't need to take three or four or five one or two the story is told hmm. move on to the next bit of information right that's george's style it, you it's a shot is only you only hold it long enough for an audience to read whatever information you want them to read in that shot. That's so important. You move on to the next one. And so that's all it was. It was just trimming. Nudgies. It was instead of seeing in a close up on Indy's feet going one, two, three. You know, it's interesting. It's like a ballet because he's he's trying to keep those 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 arrows from coming out. And sure. But in the end, you didn't need it. And it just amped up the uh, tension in the scene and you know that 10 minutes is it, uh, arguably the best 10 minutes in the history of cinema i i yeah it's hard to argue against that i mean you know that that opening because that opening sets up an entire franchise i mean that's not an easy thing to do no and and the the thing is mark uh you know everything you need to know about those characters the way they're visually depicted in that opening. Yeah. And that's one thing. If you look at all of George's movies, you'll find, in my opinion, he introduces characters. He places a real, real emphasis on introducing a character properly. And he does it probably better than anybody else. And I challenge anybody, just go look at American Graffiti. Right. When those five people show up or are seen at that diner, Mel's diner, you know who each of those people are. Right. You, you don't need any kind of exposition. You know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's also very true for Star Wars, right? Like every time yes. a new character shows up, even in the prequels, first time you see Darth Maul, boom, you got one of the most popular characters in the history of cinema, even though everybody wants to talk crap about it, it's he's still Darth Maul. And right. And the way he's introduced to that movie 
it's like it, it's it's instantaneous that that you care about this character to some degree. Well, and I think that was that was the knock. And I, you know, I don't know exactly for certain, but Boba Fett had no introduction right, right. in Empire. And and there were high, high hopes for Boba Fett. Yeah. But he's he's introduced, he's a background character. And you were somehow involved with the early tests with Boba, right? Like, uh... oh, yeah, but just just out of happenstance, I uh, Norman Reynolds brought the the costume over from England, and it was an all white Boba Fett costume at the time. But it had the jetpack and the flamethrower, and you know the helmet and all the stuff. Um, and you know, there was only it was only Ben Burt and me. Uh, there at the studio there was nobody and George and Norman and you know George I look about the right size and so here put this on and so I did and then Ben got his camera out and you know did wow, wow. so you were the first person in the history of of cinema to wear the Boba costume yeah. that's documented you were the that's first right. documented person to wear yes. Boba Fett's costume so I I put the white uniform on and and you know Ben shot a bunch of footage. And so George could kind of see it. And George, it, you know, immediately went to, it, it can't be white. It'll, then we'll mistake him as just another stormtrooper because he was a super trooper. Right. And so suddenly, you know, George gets a hammer and he bangs the helmet, puts a big dent in it. <laughs> and, and he says, we need a, we need like a, like a, a, you know, a cape, a shawl thing. I said, well, there's a Star Wars towel hanging right there in the garage. <laughs> Get that. So we put that. Oh, yeah. OK. And, you know, then he gave it to Joe Johnston at, over at ILM and paint it up, fix it up, make it look like he's battle worn and tested. That's amazing. And, and that's what it came back. Such a cool looking uniform such a cool looking and interesting the name at boba fett you know sure a, but i think i think his introduction was blown and when george in jedi you know said just just throw boba in the sarlacc pit he just said throw him in the sarlacc pit let's just be done with this guy we're just done get rid of him <laughs> <laughs> and and everybody, everybody, there's three of us in the cutting room, and we're like, no, that's Boba Fett. <laughs> right, right, right. He's like, no, I no, don't no. care. Get Possible. rid of him. <laughs> Get rid of him. And look, now he's got his own TV show. That's right. Yeah. You know, have you seen it by any chance? And I haven't I seen have. it for the record, so I I, I haven't I, seen the new TV show. I yet. have. I you know, it's it's just amazing to me. I nobody, nobody, nobody knew or thought that star wars would continue that star wars would be what it has become uh, it's just an absolute phenomenon and uh you know character like boba fett uh you know i think the 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 most genius thought in my opinion that's come after the star wars movies mm -hmm. and now i'm not a big fan of the last three yeah I, same here. i don't that the spirit of you know the first star wars called new hope it, sure. is, it was always about hope right and then right. somehow that went away and um but i but i think that whoever thought of baby yoda right i agree brilliant 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 I think it was John Favreau. I think uh, the credit goes to John Favreau for that. That could be. I mean, you know, and it seems so obvious. It's like Yoda was such a great, great character, and and so sort of real. And and you know, he took over a consciousness of of the 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 public, and you know, you had these Yoda isms, and right. you know, and and then he was gone. So, so to kind of resurrect him as a baby Yoda and offspring, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And look, um, I want to be respectful of your time. We got one minute left in my kind of mental clock, but I do want to ask you this since you brought up Yoda. When you're sitting there um, and um, you have to sort of cut the end of Yoda, was that something where you pretty much just tackle it like any other scene or... Did you like set up a special cup of coffee and maybe a fancy cigarette and 
and just really get yourself in the headspace or is it just part of the work that you're just trying to get done? Yeah, it's, you know what the important scenes are. Mm. And, you know, you, and here's something that I learned from Marsha and she broke editing down in a very simple way. She says, there's, there's three things. And I think that, you know, whether you're writing, directing or editing, there's three things to every scene. What is this scene about? Whose scene is it? Mm. And what's the most important moment in the scene? Interesting. It's just that simple. Right. Now, you know, you mentioned Luke going in. That that was the first. So the first sequence was the robots at the door. Yeah. And I showed that to George. And he said, okay, that's great. But we just got one problem. The robots are out of sync. And I said, out of sync, George, they don't even talk. They don't have mouths. Right. right. <laughs> he said, I know, but those noises, you got to hook those to, to body language. And right. when you do, it becomes more believable. And he was right. And then the next scene was, you know, Luke going down the hallway and meeting. Oh, it's my favorite scene in those uh, movies. I don't know why, but it's just Fortuna. haunting. And then I spent, I, I'll bet you I cut for at least two weeks that that scene with Luke approaching Jabba and it was so there was so much material there was so much stuff and it was just it took me a long time well you did an incredible job this has been an incredible conversation I actually hope that maybe we can keep in touch and I can bring you back one day and and, and sort of finish it I feel like we've only done chapter one you know of... I'm, I'm happy to do it mark it's fun talking to you and you know th those are all really great movies and um you know i'm just blessed and fortunate that i i got a chance to work with some really great people and and on movies that you know have legs people yeah. remember and like i just want to cheat for one second here i know that you're working on a picture right now called the happy worker that's yes. in post-production when when is that coming out? Like what what's the what's the word on that? I know that you have that that you're right that you are directing and editing it. Did you also write it? Uh, Co-write, yes. Co-write, okay. Yes. So it should come out this year. Um, COVID, you know, messed up the schedule, and and the company that financed it uh, wanted to be a you know a streaming platform, and that's their plans change. So sure. I think the idea is probably find somebody who wants to buy it and um, hopefully get into some festivals and get some exposure. And hopefully in 2022, it'll finally come out. Cool. Did you have a fun time making it? Are you happy with, with the outcome? Yeah, it was, it was very, very difficult. Every movie is difficult. And even George would tell you if you if you come away with seventy five percent of your intent when you went in and started, yeah, um, it's a victory. You, it's a victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome, um, Dwayne. Thank you so much for your generosity of your time and your beautiful stories and 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 your work. Definitely shaped me, and I can't believe I'm speaking to the man that cut that scene because, like. I always, and I used to have one of the biggest Star Wars podcasts in the world called Rule of Two. And, um, you know, I, I've talked about that scene countless times. Is like that is when the entire aesthetic of Star Wars comes to a point is when Luke is walking into Jabba's palace saying, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm here to fuck some shit up. Yeah. You know, and and uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's the thank you, Mark. And, it uh, you know, it's not me. It's, you know, uh, Richard Marquand, you know, directed and and, you know, George wrote and it's all of those things. But it's it's timing and pace mm -hmm. and and it's it's putting those moments and the reaction shots. If if I learned anything from the, I learned so much from George, but a, a, a big thing about editing is. Oftentimes the reaction shot is way more powerful than the action itself. And that scene is all reactions. Right. Right. It's you know, yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. A line is delivered and now we're going to go see how, you know, how's that person processing it. It's kind right. of hard when it's Jabba because he's just this big slug. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> 
Okay, awesome. Well, look, thank you okay, so Mark. much, Duane, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you to everybody listening, and that is goodbye from the Club Metaverse podcast. Thank you. Stay healthy. Bye.